Are you a researcher and inventor with a great idea and no clue of how to turn it into a business? Check out Eco Capital. They'll get it done. 90% of app ideas fail. If you don't want that to be you, check out Big Kitty Labs. They can help you be successful. Do you run a startup? Chances are your employees are underpaid. Give them the benefit that really matters. 614 Startups Entrepreneurs Brew. Email us today for details. Welcome to the 614 Startups Podcast, the entrepreneur's guide to launching a startup in Columbus, Ohio. 614 Startups Nation, what's up, what's up, what's up? My name is Elio Harmon, founder of 614 Startups and host of the 614 Startups Podcast. In studio today, I have my man Harley Blakeman of Honest Jobs. What's up, Harley? Hello, hello. I'm doing good, man. I'm glad to be here today. How are you? I'm good, man. I've been looking forward to this one. Because you are working on a project that not only do I find interesting, but I feel is this absolutely essential for society. And so uh, I wanted you on this podcast for us to get into a little bit and talk about kind of your experience building honest jobs. Now, at the top of every podcast, we start with a little bit of the personal. So where are you from originally and how did you come to live in Columbus, Ohio? Sure. Uh, born in Dallas, Texas. Grew up in just outside of Gainesville, Florida. Uh, I moved here the same week as Urban Meyer. So you're welcome. All right. I brought him up. Um, and that was because uh, a lot of bad things happened in my life at a young age. 14, parents got divorced. 15, my father passed away. 16, 17, dropped out of high school, got into drugs, homelessness. And basically, right after my 18th birthday, uh, I got arrested for drug trafficking in a state that I didn't live in, uh, Savannah, Georgia. So uh, I did 14 months in prison uh, just outside of Atlanta, Georgia. And while I was there, I reconnected with distant relatives here in Columbus, Ohio, who, thank God, you know, were took the time to rekindle that relationship and basically offered me a way out of what was certain to be a life of going back and forth to jail or prison because I had nowhere else to go. So... Uh, luckily, I moved, made the decision to move in with my aunt in Reynoldsburg here in Columbus. And uh, from that point, you know, it's history. I, I have had, I had some great opportunities and some great support, but worked really hard to get to where I am. And, and uh, I'm excited about what I'm doing right now. All right, man. So you, you, you told a story right there that is a podcast in and of itself, <laughs> right? We're not going to dig too deep into it. Sure. But I at least want to kind of understand... Um, because it might be foreign to some listening who may parents may have gotten divorced when they were 14, but it didn't necessarily lead them along the path that you went. So what was going on in your world, in your mind at the time that would lead you to make those types of decisions? Was it issues around, you know, I don't, I don't want to kind of talk for you, but I'm fascinated to know what was going on in your world that led you to make those types of decisions. Sure. Well, really, I think the the key thing that happened was my father passing away. Mm. So really, the only reason I add that my parents got divorced was because um, my mother left and didn't come back for like years. Long after my father passed, my mother was still addicted to drugs and alcohol and Uh, She wasn't a part of my life. So if my mother and father had been divorced and then my father passed and I still had my mom, maybe none of this stuff would have happened. But uh, when my father passed at 15, I basically just started living on like friends' couches and stuff. And So you were on your own at that point. Yeah, yeah. uh, Towards the end of 15. Um, So yeah, but definitely by the time I was 16, I was living on friends' couches, very unstable environment, a lot of emotional stress from like my father being gone, my mother being gone. And then... I never really had a parental figure as far as like, I had people who would feed me, give me a ride, but I didn't have anybody who would discipline me or tell me, don't do that. Like, you're not allowed to do that. I think people felt bad for me and they felt like they wanted to help me, but not discipline me. So at 16 years old, I just uh, started exploring, you know, marijuana, drinking, all that. And I just kind of went off the deep end with it because I didn't have anyone to answer to. And, um, it was also a way for me to make money and the people I looked up to at that age um, again it sounds weird if you're not from that that struggle that I was in at that age um, I looked up to people who um, were in the streets during the day as well like I knew adults that were 30 but they weren't at work 
they were at home playing Xbox, selling weed or selling pills, and they made money, and they would even give me stuff to make money for myself. So it was almost as if older people who did that became my parental figures. They, mm-hmm. they helped me in ways that no one else was able to help me, um, which obviously uh, is bad. And it's one of the reasons I love entrepreneurship and, uh, and, and business is uh, I can do it legally. I yeah. figured out, I learned how to do it legally. So yeah. it's fun. And I, I, it's one of the things I definitely want to do as I mature and become more, you know, senior is uh, work with youth around entrepreneurship. Yeah. And so, you know, usually when you're talking to people who've had an experience similar to yours, there's always that story of the introduction to the game, mm-hmm. right? That first you're wet behind the ears, you're hanging out with me, you're mm-hmm. smoking the weed. And then comes the conversation, either prompted by you or the other person, mm-hmm. like, yo, okay. I want to sell it. Or, hey, you should probably sell it. What was your introduction to the game story? Yeah, so uh, I hate I hate telling people this because I, personal, but I don't really believe that marijuana is a gateway drug. So <laughs> <laughs> I believe that it's a gateway drug because it's illegal. Uh-huh. To, to, to get it, you have to break the law. You have to hang out with criminals. So all of a sudden you're breaking the law and hang out with criminals. Right. Whereas if it was legal, I don't think people would go hang out with cocaine dealers to get some weed. <laughs> Anyways, <laughs> long story short, it started with weed. It was the low hanging fruit. I can make 50 bucks a week or something to like buy alcohol on the weekends to party. But uh, the first time I really got put on, you know, was uh, I knew a registered nurse who was getting giant amounts of prescription pills from Miami. And she knew that I did the pills. I had started doing them and I, and I was going to parties and stuff where people were doing them. She's like, hey, I, I would give you whatever you want. You can just pay me back later if you want to make some extra money. And me, I'm like, I look up to this girl. She's got a lot of money. She's offering to give me free stuff. Why would I not do it? I'll just do it. And that's how it started was, uh, I remember one time she gave me like 500 prescription pills. It was like thousands of dollars worth of drugs. And she just gave it to me. It was like, pay me back 20% of what you make. And, you know, that's a big margin. Seemed like that's a, a big deal. margin. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. All right. And so, uh, so I'm guessing that this whole thing, and I'm sorry, man, I'm digging into this, but I, you know, sure. it, 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 it 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 it's helping me understand why sometimes we might make a judgment about someone simply because what a piece of paper like a single line mm-hmm. on a background check says yep. convicted of served x number but we never really if you're an employer bring that person in and say can you tell me about the fact that you yep. lost your father and your mom left Absolutely. and there's none of that. It's like, there's a line on the form and it's just filled out. So I'm digging into this yeah. to kind of get, get well, a better understanding. Well, what's interesting is like, as you ask me about it, I'm making light about it, mm-hmm. joking a little bit because I have to, like, it's something that we felons literally struggle with this their whole life. And if you don't make light of it, it it's just going to bear you down. The truth is though, like you're saying, like you're alluding to is it's pain. There's pain in the history of most people with felons is it wasn't an easy road where they just like threw their life away. It's very, most felons I know struggled, family issues, abuse, poverty, whatever, you know, whatever it is, uh, there's a painful story usually behind them. So if they're in front of you and they got into that interview, you should give them extra credit for that. Mm -hmm. And so that's part of the conversation I have with HR managers and, and people all the time is like, there's a, there's a story behind everyone who has a, a, a criminal record and, and it's important to understand that. And that's really how I was able to get job offers is refusing to just do the interview. No, I'm going to come in and I'm going to tell you who I am mm-hmm. because you're not going to hire me if you don't know who I am. That's absolutely important. Yeah. And a big concern with that also is recidiv- recidivism. Perfect. Right? Yep. All right. That's a tongue twister for me. Uh, and in your case, you were able to reconnect with family here in Columbus, Ohio, which then puts you on a different path. Mm-hmm. And fast forward now to you starting this company. What's the in-between between between your relocation to Columbus and now you starting this company? Um, Extreme amounts of dedication and focus that I don't know if I have the same level of dedication and focus now that I did then. (laughs) I I I couldn't find any good jobs, wash dishes. Uh, I was washing dishes 50, 60 hours a week and they didn't even pay me overtime. It was at a Japanese restaurant. And I saved up maybe seven grand before I applied to Columbus State Community College, business school, the, not business school, business classes. 
I did two semesters there and man, I had new focus, like being arrested, doing that time, coming out with a fresh slate. Like I had a new energy and I was, I did terrible in high school. I dropped out of high school because I was doing so bad. But in college at Columbus State Community College, I had like a three nine after three semesters. I applied to Ohio State and got in. So I, I went to Fisher College of Business at Ohio State uh, with a prison GED. I got into there and um, just networked, did extra stuff, got a, got certified in Six Sigma, got a, a business degree in operations management, and uh, wrote a book my senior year about overcoming a criminal record. So I was extra. I was doing all types of stuff. Part of that was because I was in a new environment. I really didn't have friends. Like I, It was just work and school. I just wanted to better myself. And um, my senior year, I, I I said this in a talk I gave recently, is I interviewed with three dozen companies and got 35 rejection letters because my uh, because my record. One company made me an offer after three dozen interviews, uh, even though I had like graduated with honors. So uh, that tells you like I I was doing everything I possibly could above and beyond, and still it was by the skin of my teeth I got hired by uh, Owens Corning, which mm-hmm. is a large manufacturer in Newark, Ohio. Yeah. Okay. So, man, dude, that 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 is such an impressive story. And like you said, you, the the why at that time was so powerful. Absolutely. That it pushed you through. And so you're working corporate. Mm-hmm. When does this entrepreneurial bug? Because we know you are already an entrepreneur, but you were just mm-hmm. doing it in a different setting. When did the bug really say, "Hey, look, this is great, but I'm I'm thinking about doing something else." Yeah, so all through college, what's interesting is like people think like, "Oh, he started this company." Like I've I've been started companies a long time ago. I just fail at all of them. So like freshman year I started a nutrition company. At least I tried to like uh I started like this like ride sharing company for like getting your car worked on. Like people would come pick your car up and take it, drop it off, bring it back. Uh, started before Honest Jobs was a learning platform for people with criminal records. And we basically out of that never found market fit, pivoted into this. So it was always there uh, all through college, even during my job at Owens Corning. Like I could not think straight. I did it the best I could to be a good employee, but I always felt guilty because I was like, I'm not committed to this. Like I never once did it click. Like I love this company. I love what my job, I was always thinking like, how can I do more? How can I be bigger? Um, so I was at Owens Corning for about six months. I got promoted to a supervisor role. So, I mean like 65 K a year is pretty good for your first year out of college. Um, I had every reason to be happy with it, but for some reason I had really gotten into this, like helping people with criminal records idea and went through Rev1 with my first concept, worked on it for months. And one day I just was like, I can't handle being here anymore, (laughs) Uh, working the long hours. And uh, I felt like it was blocking me from hitting major milestones in developing what could be now honest jobs. So uh, I didn't even really have any paying customers. I'd saved up some money. I cashed out my 401k and I left my job with maybe six, seven grand. And, uh, it was reckless. (laughs) It was really risky, but, uh, that's entrepreneurship I think is calculated risk, but it was definitely very risky. Mm -hmm. And so you said this is your first project. So while you're at Owens Corning, you're working on your first project. So honest jobs is not the first venture that you've tried to get off the ground. Is that correct? Yeah. When I left Owens Corning, I was actually working on a thing called comeback collective, which was a learning platform that taught people with criminal records, how to rebuild credit, how to interview, how to get into college, how to do all the things basically I had done. And it wasn't so much about me. It was just like, how can we teach these skills to, you know, the 27 million people that have felonies? Mm -hmm. And and I was trying to figure out product market fit for how to sell that in a way that it could be sustainable. And we we never really figured it out. So now we're, we're packaging that as free services on our job board. So now if you're looking for a job on our platform, now you can just learn all those things for free Gotcha. as an extra benefit to people looking for work. I got you. Now, um, there are, Tons of giants in the uh, job board space, mm-hmm. right? You got your Indeed, Career Builder, and then there's the specialized ones mm-hmm. that actually, you know, Monster. you're recruiting, yeah, yeah. for specific Absolutely. types of jobs. I know this is a need uh, for people who have a criminal background, but did you look at it from the employer's perspective that? you know, they might be skeptical. What gave you the confidence to really, or what research did you do to say, hey, this is not only a need from the 
uh, someone who might have a felony, this can also actually help employers. Sure, yeah. So I did not intend to start honestjobs.co. I was working on Comeback Collective through the Rev1 program, Learning Lab. We did a ton of research and we asked them like, hey, what features are you interested in? Some of the features were features we had. Some of the features were features we didn't have or didn't even want to do, but it was kind of unbiased research. And everyone said they wanted connection to jobs. So I ignored that for months. I was like, no, we're not doing jobs. That's not what we do. But when I had trouble finding market fit, I was like, we need cash. Like this company's not going to last if we can't make cash. So I reached out to some warehouses and stuff around Columbus and was like, if we can find you employees to like start today, would you pay anything for that? What would you pay? And immediately, the literally day one, a customer said, I'll give you $240 right now. Like we said, if we can get you an employee in here today, would you, how much would you pay us? He's like, oh, we agreed on $240. So I was like, okay, you know, can I get them 10 a week so that this is actually like, you know, a profitable business? Maybe, maybe not, maybe not here in just Columbus. So immediately me and my business partner over a weekend cranked out a product, a, a MVP of a job board where anyone can create an account, post a job, and then we'll connect them, kind of automate it a little bit uh, for sustainability. And immediately, you know, we had to test our hypothesis. Will employers post jobs? If they will, for free, will people apply to those jobs? So that's the second hypothesis. The third hypothesis, will employers pay to post the jobs? So one was validated day one. Yes, they'll post jobs. Two was validated within like three days. We had a bunch of people come to the website looking for jobs. And then now we're finally at that point where we've proved employers are willing to pay for that. Um, and really, it was just walking into places. We literally walked into a place here in Columbus and started talking uh, to the HR guy. And like the next day, he processed the payment. Uh, so that's part of it was the research through Rev1. And then part of it was just, you know, reaching out Hitting to them. the and, pavement, real yeah. world fee- feedback and exactly. getting people to go to the website. Exactly. All right. Now, so... Um, you have all these people who are out there looking and you know, we have a, a absolutely abysmal workforce participation rate, right? It's like 62% of all the eligible people who could be working are actually working. And that's for any number of reasons. Uh, and so when you're looking at sectors that could benefit the most from adopting what we're going to quote unquote call second chance employment, where are you seeing the greatest opportunities uh, in, in which sectors? Industries, like, okay, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so we haven't explored all of them, so I can't say that these are the best, but from the data we have, it tends to be uh, logistics manufacturing, so warehousing, manufacturing, uh, truck driving, call centers. Um, it's usually non-customer facing. Um, of course, not not money, not um, tech most tech companies, I believe, will hire people with records. It's just that the the amount of people with criminal records that have tech skills is so low that it, it's not super appealing to them. However, when you think about blue collar work, hourly work, uh, trades, so trades like uh, we had a company wanting us just to post all of their maintenance and electrician jobs because uh, they, again, it, it's not customer facing. Like if they have the skill set, they don't mind if you have a record. Um, but yeah, those those are definitely uh, the biggest. However. We have about 20 salary positions on our website, uh, ranging from universities looking for like program managers for the social work department, and they're completely open to it. They post with us uh, to um, restaurant general manager positions posted on our website. And of course, we're hiring right now, too. Mm -hmm. So (laughs) felons are welcome to work with us. So here's what's what's amazing, though, is um, this new conversation around, you know, 2020, right? presidential campaign everybody's rolling out their platform ai self-driving automation right so you're hearing it from can- candidates like uh, andrew yang who's somebody i listen to and i consume his content and around universal basic income and issues like that i want to deal with those two things separately uh the wave of automation and self-driving especially if you're seeing now, like you said, you haven't explored all sectors. But for those sectors where where it used to take X number of people to run a warehouse, with the introduction of automation, robotics, et cetera, we're going to see that number go down. Sure. What, what is that 
what are you thinking now when you're thinking about, okay, skills that are going to be applicable in the future, even if you can solve some short term issues, you're now going to have a replication of the, those yeah. issues once AI and automation start to reach scale. And, and another one is just a recession. Mm-hmm. If there's a recession, people are going to lose work. And if there's more people who don't have records looking for work, then there's going to be less likely that they would pay us to find them people that do have records. So, so we, so that's very real. That's a, that's a real thing. And unfortunately people with criminal records are always going to be the first people. The most vulnerable. Yeah. The most vulnerable to this uh, besides people with like disabilities or, or, or anything like that. But, um, one, one of the things, uh, an application that's going to be part of our platform that we're working on developing right now is, Anyone who hires someone who just got out of jail or prison is eligible for work opportunity tax credits. So let's say you you run a a retail chain that has manufacturing, warehousing, all that. If you hire someone who got out of prison 11 months ago, no matter what their crime is, if you hire them, you will get $9,600 back at the end of the year in tax credits for each employee you hire. So for us, we are working ourselves into a position to where when times get tough, we pay you rather than you spending money to hire people through us. Oh yeah, you got to cut 20 people. Well, let's cut people that aren't going to give us 10 grand at the end of the year if you're going to pay them all the same anyways. Right. So, we're trying to to build a couple tools into our platform that make us recession proof or not necessarily less a little less vulnerable to those situations. Um, but until the the stigma and you know, really until mass incarceration in America goes away, this is going to continue to be a problem. Mm-hmm. So uh, we're doing our best. All right. And, you know, I think that's that's such a diff- difficult question that we'll have to grapple with as a society, right? Because it's not only going to affect people who have, like you said, um, a felony, even if you have programs like uh, tax credits to help anchor those people mm-hmm. if possible, uh, and not just maybe those people being sacrificed for the sake of the bottom line, right? Yeah. So, um you, you, you know, and from your experience, when you did spend, you know, th- that time serving time, do you feel like we have a prison education system that would even begin to address? Because you're you're there, mm-hmm. you're captive, essentially, yeah. and you're in some cases spending an equivalent of, you know, at least community college and sometimes longer. Is there... Do you see an, any initiatives that would give people the skills that they need so that when they come out, if the stigma does go away, that they're actually prepared to, to, to step into some of those opportunities? Yeah. So I have seen them. They're few and far between. Um, I Where I went to prison, there was church and GED. That was it. There was no other opportunities, which, which was, at the time, I thought it was just normal. Uh, living here in Columbus, uh, I don't know all the prisons here. I know some of them are really bad. Uh, I know that recidivism is not the best in Ohio. Um, but so let's say uh, the women's prison here is one of the best prisons in the country, in my opinion, because they have so many programs. The women can learn huge amounts of, of certifications and classes. I have a friend that I met after he got out of prison, but this guy went to Marion, prison in Marion, Ohio, and they had a, a, a coding boot camp in he has worked in tech now for three, four years. It's just SQL, I mean, database stuff, but he, you know, making close to 30 bucks an hour with, you know, six years in prison and violent offenses. And that's amazing. And we absolutely, it's a whole, whole discussion around education in America, but like we should be providing free education to people while they're in prison because it's going to make our community safer. It's going to fix families. It's going to provide opportunity to people who have historically not had opportunity. But of course we don't, provide great education to people who aren't in prison so Mm -hmm. it's it's a whole discussion but uh, there are programs like that california has several of them Uh, there's a thing called defy ventures where they teach uh, people entrepreneurship there are big uh, programs in prisons i think there's one in like san quentin which is like the worst prison in the country but you can go through like a a 28 week coding boot camp and like people are working for google and stuff who went through that program because it's so good It takes people in the community, though, to put together like a solid program and then find a way to get it into the prisons. And it's hard because uh, prisons don't want progress. They literally want no technology in the prison. They're like, no, we can't even have Internet. Like, don't bring it here. Don't bring computers in here. Don't bring cell phones. Don't bring anything. Um, And that's 
obviously terrible. Mm -hmm. And because they have to weigh the pros and cons, right? Of, I mean, definitely the pros might outweigh the cons, but there are definitely some issues there in figuring out you, how you could work with technology Security. companies to try to mitigate those issues, you know, might help. Um, so if you have, if we have an employer listening or we have somebody who's in a situation, uh, where do they go? How do they get in contact with you? And what's your process? Sure. So uh, anyone who has an interest in posting jobs, uh, you can find me on LinkedIn, Harley Blakeman, and feel free to ask me any questions. Uh, you can also go to our website, which is honestjobs.co. So it's honestjobs.co. Uh, you can just go ahead and create an account. It's free to create an account. You can post three jobs for free. Um, if you want to post more than three jobs, you would sign up for one of our, our monthly plans, um, which is still very competitive pricing. It's oftentimes cheaper than LinkedIn. I mean, uh, Indeed. Uh, but you can also request a demo if maybe you don't want to sign up yet. You want to, you have some questions. Uh, we have on the same page where you could create an account. There's also a request a demo button where I would call you personally and we'd have a conversation to make sure that our product's a good fit for your business needs. Uh, so all the answers should be right there on honestjobs.co. You can go in there, post jobs for free, and hopefully we'll drive some really good candidates to your, uh, to your job postings. Got you. Now, um, so two things. What do you want the impact of your company to be? And what do you want your personal impact to be? The second question's hard. <laughs> my my uh, kind of the vision for the company is that honestjobs.co will be the single largest contributor to the reduction of recidivism in America. So we want it to be clear and like undisputed that we have helped more families restabilize and we've helped more people break that cycle than any other platform because there's literally thousands of nonprofits all across the country that work with this population. However, no one has a national brand that is really impacting every community. Our goal is to be in every community and the go-to resource that people can get out. And instead of taking six months to find a job, they can find a job in six days. That's, that's our vision for the company is to be the single uh, largest contributor to the reduction of recidivism. Uh, me personally, uh, I, my goal is just to inspire people uh, who come from come from less. Like I said earlier, I love I love the idea of helping uh, like underserved youth with teaching entrepreneurship because entrepreneurship is, is the way out from from everything. Right? There's two ways out: either make money legally or or make money illegally. So I want to teach people uh, how to do that legally. Terrific. And if you could rewind the tape to the younger you, is there any piece of advice, something that you know now? If you went back to your younger self, that one thing that you would tell your younger self? Hmm. Um, it's going to sound cheesy, but it would it would be like just spend more time with family, like people who love you. Because uh, it's not it's not about to me, it, all the would you go back to do something differently in entrepreneurship? To me, it's always a no, like every failure I ever had was totally worth it. If it was a bunch of money or if it was a waste of time. Uh, everything I've done up to this point has just helped me get better at what I'm doing. Uh, but as far as really valuing the time you spend in your community or with your family or, or whoever you're with, just, I would be more present, I think. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, Harley, thank you so much, man. I know you probably weren't expecting to come into a business podcast and talk about the personal so much. So I appreciate you going there and allowing us to kind of share in your story. Um, we end every podcast with my one takeaway. And my one takeaway is this, don't judge. Simply because you see a single line on a piece of paper that tells you what someone did at some point in their past, there's always a story that goes beyond that. Take the time to get to know the story and get to know the person before you draw your conclusion. Thank you again for joining me on another episode of the 614 Startups Podcast. Peace. Thank you so much for joining us on the 614 Startups Podcast. My name is Elio Harmon. Episodes of the podcast roll out every week at www.614startups.com and on iTunes. Don't forget, follow us on IG and Facebook at 614 Startups. Peace.